Hello there, so today we'll be taking a look at the inside of this IBM Personal Computer 720 100DX4 system. In the previous video we looked at the front panel and the back side where we saw all the ports that were available in the system. Today we'll actually open up the lid and take a look inside. Alright, so we're looking at the back of the system now. We notice that there are two screws, one over here and one over here, that need to be taken off in order to get the um, top cover off. Alright, so just gotta take these screws off. Actually, it turned out that the um, chassis was a little bit bent on the right hand side over here and there's a little notch that I can show close up. Let's get the screw out. There's actually a... So there's a little extension of the chassis that goes into or extension of the lid that goes into a little hole in the chassis. It turned out that it seemed like it was squashed from the side a little bit and as a result this thing was really jammed into that hole and was really hard to get out. Um, what did I do? I think the first time around I actually was able to get the lid off but I couldn't put it back in. So what I ended up having to do was hammer this little bit to get the tab pushed in a little bit I believe so that the cover could come off and go back in a little more easily. So now that we've taken the screws out, we should be able to take the lid off. So taking a lid off shouldn't be too difficult, I don't think. Yeah, there it goes. And we just have to slide it out. And let's see, it's like this. Yeah, and just lift it off like so. There it goes. All right, so now that we have the cover off, let's take a look inside. So first of all, there's this little interesting looking card over here. It's actually a little small card that's connected to the motherboard through this little connector. Apparently this is a PCI interface network card. So you can look from the top, zoom in. It's actually a AMD chip that says PCNet PCI. This is actually the card that's connected to the network port over here via this little cable that goes from here all the way to the back through the card slot and the riser over there. All right, next we notice that there's BIOS backup battery over here. I've actually already changed this with a new one. So this is an actual lithium battery that was in the system before. It's a Panasonic CR2032 3 volt lithium battery made in Japan. As you can see, it's already been over 20 years since it was installed in the system. It hasn't really puffed up or anything like that. Yeah, I'm lucky that this wasn't leaking in the system. So I just went ahead and replaced it with a new one that I got at a local hardware store just because that's where I found one. And the new one I put in is made by Fujitsu. It's one of the few batteries that are actually still made in Japan, so I, so I figured I eh, just might as well replace the battery that was made in Japan 25 years ago with a battery that was made in Japan recently. Next we see the memory module over here. It's a 72 pin memory module and, and what I've noticed in opening this case up today was that this actually has nine chips on the SIM module. Regularly you only see like eight of these, but on this one you see nine. It turns out there's actually a SIM with a parity bit on there. So there's eight chips for the individual bits in a byte, and there's an extra bit used for parity. And I've never actually used parity RAM before, so I'm not sure exactly how it works, but from what I've read up in Wikipedia, apparently if there's memory error, the system can detect that there's been an error and might go into halt state or something like that. So it's a little bit different from the ECC RAM that you have these days where it can actually correct those errors in order to improve system reliability, especially in servers and such. So that was kind of interesting that I was able to find parodied RAM in this machine, which I guess would be kind of appropriate if you consider that these were actually built for businesses. All right, next, there's a couple of memory chips that are put into these two sockets. 
Apparently, from what I read up in the IBM PC 720 micro channel system maintenance manual, these are actually video RAM for the video chip that's on the motherboard. I'm not exactly sure where the video chip is on this system, but I'm just going to guess from the locality is that one of these two or both of these have to do with the video. And it's actually pretty common back then from what I remember, there would actually be video graphics chips on the motherboard itself. Just like in this case, there is no actual separate graphics adapter card that's installed in the system, but you can see that there is a SVGA port on the back of the machine. So that kind of explains why you would see the video RAM installed directly into the motherboard. Also, there is a little header over here that says VESA Video. I'm not exactly really familiar with this port before because I've never actually used VESA Local Bus video cards before, but from watching videos from like V Westlife, I heard him mention that this was used for video overlays when you would have a video capture card. Maybe you'd be capturing TV or something and would like to show it on Windows or something. They would actually use this to take the video from, I would guess, the video capture card and feed it into the video so that the overlay can be performed without having to use the CPU power because the CPUs back then weren't really beefy enough to handle those kind of overlays in software. Oh, just one interesting thing I noticed was that all these memory chips on there appear to be made by Samsung. It actually says made in Korea everywhere. For example, this memory chip over here actually says SEC, which I believe means Samsung Electronics Company or such. While these chips over here have this little logo with three boxes with stars inside, is my guess. Well, anyway, considering Samsung, the name actually means three stars in Korean, this memory chip doesn't actually mention the manufacturer, but I'm just going to guess from that logo that that's a Samsung chip as well. So it's kind of interesting because I've never really seen this logo in recent machines at all. As you can see, the system has a riser so they can make the chassis less tall. This was pretty common back in the days when desktop systems were actually systems that you would put on your desk with maybe a CRT thing on top. I guess you don't see this kind of risers inside so often. You actually see them in servers sometimes, but for most PCs these days, I think they're just cards that are directly put into the motherboard. So this riser card is kind of interesting because it's a mixture of the MCA, Microchannel Architecture Bus, and a PCI bus. At the time this system was built, around 1995, PCI bus would have been actually a pretty new standard. And the MCA bus would have been its real late days almost getting phased out. So this riser card is actually a pretty interesting mishmash of architectures that I don't think that was really common to see together. Okay, so we have the riser card and the card slot covers over here. These actually look very similar to the slot covers you would see in microchannel bus systems with the little metal tab shaped like this and you would actually have the slot cover screws on the outside rather than in the inside that you would see in AT systems. Oh, and as you can see, there's only two slots, but there's three slots on the riser card itself. I'm just going to guess that the PCI card is going to be occupying the bottom slot just from the position, so probably the bottom slot can only be used by either one PCI card or one MCA card, one or the other. Oh, one more thing that I thought was kind of interesting was this chip over here. The interesting thing about this chip package is you can see the wires coming from the pins of the chip that goes down into the die. I think I've seen other IBM chips during this era manufactured in this way such as the um, PowerPC chips, like the PowerPC 603, 604, also came in this kind of package as well. So I thought that was kind of an interesting blast from the past that I could find in the system. Okay, I think we've pretty much covered the interesting parts that we could see on this side of the system. So I guess we'll go ahead and take a look at this side next. All right, so let's take a look at this side of the system next. So the obvious things we can see is that there is a floppy drive right here. And it's the it's a floppy drive that supports both 1.44 and 1.2 megabyte standards. It's made by TIAC, and as you can see, it's still nice and shiny without any sign of corrosion or dust. So that's actually pretty amazing for a system that was built over 20 years ago. 
Next, we have the hard drive over here. It's a IBM hard drive with a capacity of 728 megabytes. And what's interesting about this is that it actually mentions the cylinder heads and sector numbers because BIOS in the past needed to get these hard drive characteristics in order to recognize how to use them and such. And this hard drive looks pretty beefy and such, but it's probably about the same size as the current 3.5 inch hard drives. And you can see the colorful IDE connector that gets connected to the IDE port on the motherboard right there. You can also see power cables and such all living under here in this little tiny space. Yeah, it's packed pretty well. You can tell that these desktop systems were made to be as thin as possible, but fit as much as they can. And also you can see that the power supply is down here. And is there any space down here? It doesn't really look like you can fit another hard drive or anything in there. But there is space for another drive, probably a, f a slim five and a quarter inch drive, maybe. It looks a little bit too small to fit a regular CD-ROM drive in there. Oh wait, actually there is, I'm gonna have to take that back that it couldn't fit anything else in the bottom of the floppy drive. There's actually a space for something here as well. Maybe another floppy drive perhaps? Well, anyway. Let's go on to other parts that we can see. So next, there's actually the CPU over here in the Socket 3 Zero Insertion Force socket. So as you can see, there's a little lever over here that you can pull up, which will unlock this socket, and it'll just slide it to the right a little bit so that the CPU can be taken out. And this CPU is actually the Intel 486DX4 100 megahertz processor, which was the fastest 486 processor that Intel actually made. So behind the CPU, we see another heatsink, and that is actually the 128 kilobytes of L2 super cache. I'm not exactly sure what that super cache means, but as you can see, it has a heatsink on there, so it must get pretty hot. Next, there's actually a PCMCIA adapter board, which is connected to the riser card through a, what appears to be an ISA interface. I'm not sure if I can verify that, but that's kind of what it looks like. And as you can see, that allows the system to have two PCMCIA slots. And a final feature that I thought was kind of interesting was that there's a battery over here that connects to the riser card. I'm not exactly sure what the purpose is. I'm just gonna guess that it's used for backing up configuration information that might be stored in the riser card perhaps. But anyway, it doesn't look like it has leaked or anything, so I'm kind of lucky there. I might replace this if I'm able to, but in this form, I didn't have any issues booting into the system, so I'm not exactly sure when I'll take care of this. That pretty much covers the interesting parts about this IBM PC720 system. In subsequent videos, I think I'll show you the software that this system came preloaded with. I actually was able to boot this system off the hard drive without any problems. Started up PC DOS and Windows 3.1 without any problems. So I think I'll show you some of those things next time. That pretty much wraps up the video for today. If you like this video, I appreciate it if you give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'll also be putting up some recommended videos and other videos that might be of interest, so if anything looks interesting, please take a look. As always, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.